Welcome to the Sydney DevOps meetup. The, uh, this is the February meetup. And, uh, lovely to have you here. And uh, there's a little hint as to what, what the significance of this date is in, uh, in this opening slide here, but we'll talk about that in a second. I'm, uh, I'm Lindsay, my co-organizer Michael is lurking somewhere in the background, I think, somewhere in here. And uh, yeah, we've been doing this for a little while now. Before I dive in, though, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia, which in my case is the dark and young people, and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Pay our respects to their elders past and present. Sovereignty has never been ceded and treaties have never been signed. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Well, as I said before, welcome to the February meetup. It is actually our 12th birthday today. So we, uh, we're still the longest running GevOps meetup in the world. And it's lovely to have all of you here. Um, uh, funnily enough, our 10th birthday, our, our, our you know, first decade, uh, was the last in-person meetup that we held. Um, and we've been doing them uh, online ever since then. So um, yeah, maybe one day we'll go back to being in person, but uh, for now, online is working out pretty well for us. Uh, before I uh, continue, I just want to do a quick reminder uh, about the Code of Conduct, which is that we don't tolerate harassment of meetup participants in any form. Uh, all language and communication should be appropriate for a professional audience. Uh, and remember that harassment, sexist, racist, and exclusionary jokes are not appropriate at DevOps Sydney. If you have any problems, uh, feel free to message me through either uh, Zoom or uh, you can do it through the meetup interface as well, and I will help you out. Great thing about doing things online is that it's really easy to boot people. I haven't needed to do that yet, but the capability is there and I am uh, primed and ready to use it. All right, so tonight's agenda, uh, we've got a spectacular talk lined up. I'm really excited to see this. Uh, so we've got uh, the intro, which is the thing that I'm doing right now though, and uh, we're gonna roll into events and jobs uh, pretty much straight away. And uh, then we've got the uh, one and only talk for this evening. Uh, quick reminder for the job section we're going to do in a second. Um, if you are looking to fill a position, either you are hiring or you're looking to be hired, uh, you'll have 30 seconds to be able to talk about the position. Um, so feel free to drop something in the chat. Uh, I see that somebody's already started doing that. Rashid, lovely to have you drop something in the chat already. Um, and I will call on you and uh, we, can, we can talk about the, uh, the jobs that you're looking to hire for. Or be hired for. So tonight's talk, we've got Liz Fong Jones talking about managing risk with service level objectives and chaos engineering. Uh, you've all seen uh, the talk description. I'm just going to try and get to it as quickly as possible because uh, I'm, I'm definitely pumped to see it. Oh, great. And we've got somebody that's popping up with uh, with a couple of jobs already. So make sure that you, uh, you if, you, if you're looking to be hired or to hire, make sure you pop something in the chat. Uh, so before we... Uh, we move into the main part of the intro. Um, who here is a first timer? Feel free to pop up in the chat either with a reaction and we've got a one hand there, which is lovely to see. Oh yeah, Liz. Yep, that's right. You are the first timer. That's your point. <laughs> lovely to have you here, Liz. And we've got Anders as well. Uh, we've got a couple of other people. We've got uh, Renia and Tom Mack. Lovely. It's great to have you all here for the first time. And uh, feel free to pop in as well into the chat where you are, you are where you're coming in from. Um, typically, when we run these meetups, uh, we're in the before times. Um, most people were based in Sydney, but uh, often we'd have people that are, that'd pop around to the meetup if they happen to be in town. But uh, the great thing about running our meetups online, it, the pandemic has been the great level when it comes to uh, getting to meetup events. So we've got a couple of people already popping in where they're uh, where they're coming in from. So we've got Pablo saying he's coming in from Scott Head, or Scott's Head. We've got Glenn uh, Glenn Sardi coming in from the past and from Perth. Lovely to have you here all the way from the other side of the country. We've got a bunch of other folks from Sydney. Oh, we've got David, a first timer from Malaysia, which is lovely to have you here. And Liz has noted that she's on Woolloomooloo, which is Gadigal land, which is lovely to see. And Indrajit, we've got from Sydney as well. Oh, and we've got uh, Rashid coming in from Melbourne and Jerome from Sri Lanka. Well, wow, it is lovely to have all of you here. Uh, it's, you know, been pretty, a pretty nice thing about the, uh, one of the few nice things really about the pandemic and that we uh, get to broaden the reach and you get to see great content from fantastic speakers from all around the world. All right, well, um, one quick note on that as well. The online meetups are gonna continue indefinitely. I'm sure you all saw the notification this afternoon that um, uh, all the restrictions are being released uh, as it will. A bunch of them tomorrow and then uh, another bunch at the end of next week. 
I think that's crazy. Uh, and I get to run this event and I am not going to be going back to in-person meetups uh, too soon. Uh, maybe later this year, um, maybe things will calm down. Maybe they won't, who knows? Uh, but I don't know what your personal risk uh, tolerance is, but uh, I'm pretty happy running online meetups. So I'm just gonna keep doing that for a while. All right, events very quickly. Um, oh yeah, an outdoor summer meetup. Actually, that's a great call, Liz. Um, we should, uh, it's a bit bit hot to be inside at the moment, but um, yeah, given that we're rolling into autumn, that might actually be uh, more of a thing that we should uh, that we should definitely look into. Events-wise, there's only one that's coming up um, uh, that, that I've at least got here in the slides today, although if you've got other events that you're, uh, that you're aware of, feel free to pop it into the chat and we can talk about that. Um, Ah, yes, Liz has actually popped in that we've got SRECon happening here in Sydney as well. I completely missed that. And that is December 7th to the 9th, and she is co-chairing, which is lovely to see. Um, if you've never been to an SRECon before, um, really spectacular technical content. Uh, you can't go past it. Um, and really great speakers from across the world working on pretty interesting problems at a huge scale. So I highly recommend heading to SRECon. Um, I'll pop a slide in at the end when I when I wrap up at the end of the meetup, just as a pointer there, but it's uh, usenix.org slash SRECon. Uh, we also have uh, a little bit closer to that, um, or closer to now at least, we've got the DevOps Talk Conference, so which is March 24 and 25th. That's going to be in Melbourne. Uh, they actually have a, uh, a Kiwi event as well uh, later in that same week. Uh, but if you're interested in either of those events, that's at uh, devops.talksplus.com. That is a face-to-face -face, uh, event. So if that fits your risk profile, then go nuts. I hope you have a lot of fun. Um, oh, and Glenn's popped in that we've got another conference as well called the DevOps Conference, uh, which is in CT, so essentially European time. That is on March 8 to 9. Well, given that we are about to have slightly better time zone overlap with Europe, um, actually, that might be a little bit before we go into the, the better time zone overlap. But if you're uh, a bit of a night owl and are willing to stay up a bit late, that might be a great conference to pop in as well. Uh, actually, the other one as well, you know, I've now that I, now that we're talking about all these different conferences, there's a whole other one that I completely forgot to mention as well, which is a KawaiCon, which is a security-focused conference. It's going to be in Wellington. Um, so I'll pop up a slide about that as well at the end um, so people are able to refer to it, and I'll pop something in the event, uh, the Meetup event page as well so you can find links to all these different fine events. All right, so a few people mentioned in the chat before that they are hiring or looking to be hired. Um, so I noticed the first one that we had there was uh, Rashid. Um, feel free to, uh, to unmute and um, take it away, 30 seconds. Well, my name is Rashid Khan, and uh, I'm actually right now in Malibu. <coughs> and I started off my uh, DevOps, basically the learning journey, uh, two months back, uh, because my brother in introduced me to the DevOps world, and he has been guiding me. And uh, I started off learning uh, Kubernetes. Uh, so I'm at the end, towards the end. I'm looking forward to give the exam by next month. And yeah, so I'm looking forward to basically learn more and try to understand what are the challenges and solve the important problems which are in the industry. So yeah, pretty much awesome. this. Yeah. Great. Well, it's lovely to have you here um, yeah. all the way from Melbourne. And um, yeah, if you are looking to hire um, somebody like Rashid, um, feel free to uh, to hit him up through the chat. Uh, I think we've also got Matt Hope as well. Um, he's talking about engineering manager and engineering roles at Nine. Matt, take it away. G'day, g'day, g'day. So Nine, very large media conglomerate these days. Uh, we are looking for developers. We are looking for engineers. We are looking for SREs. We've got a few different roles across a number of different teams. I don't have an easy advertising link because they took the old one down and the one I did have didn't have all the teams. One of the ones or a couple of the roles that I'm particularly interested in trying to fill right now is an engineering manager role, as well as some engineering and SRE-esque roles. There's also a bunch of dev teams looking for people. So if you've got anything... Anything that I've said sounds interesting to you, shoot me a message and we'll have a quick chat. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. And if you do manage to get a, uh, a link that is viewable, um, feel free to pop it on the uh, on the Meetup page as well in a comment and uh, people can find it that way. Awesome. All right. And then we've got one of the persons hit me up as well. We've got uh, Gokul Ready. Um, Gokul, take it away. 
Hello, uh, I'm Gokul Sahaba for KPMG, but our team is like one of the venture in KPMG. Like It's like a startup within KPMG. Uh, so we are obviously hiring for DevOps role and also developers. Uh, mainly the DevOps probably as more people are interested here. It will be like you basically own the DevOps for our startup. Like we are looking for a kind of a lead engineer, lead DevOps engineer kind of role uh, who can basically own the complete infrastructure for us and then obviously improve and uh, get more uh, new tools into our uh, existing thing. We can uh, uh, talk later. I will put in my LinkedIn uh, link. You can probably message me there. Awesome. Thank you, Gokul. Um, all right, last call as well for the job section, if anybody's got anything. Otherwise, we're going to roll into Liz's talk. Oh, we've got uh, Tam Mack that's also posted a link to isovalent.com slash careers. Tam, do you want to talk about your uh, the jobs that you're hiring for at the moment? Uh, yeah, sure. Actually, it's not the role that I'm hiring for. Recently, I just joined Isovalent. And uh, there's a bunch of positions we are looking for right now. Uh, the position is fully remote. So obviously I need to find a college that I can talk to during the normal uh, working hour in Australia right now, because most of the team either in the US or in uh, Europe. Thanks. If you need anything, uh, just uh, ping me. Awesome. Thanks, Tam. All right, anybody else? Last call before we roll into the talk. All right, well, let's get this show on the road, Liz. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If I can work out how to Zoom after two years of a pandemic and I'll hand it to you. Wonderful. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, hello from uh, Woolloomooloo. Uh, and I am excited to talk to you about some of the experiences that we've had at Honeycomb over the past couple of years with uh, growing the reliability of our service through practicing uh, observability, obviously because we're a company that focuses on observability, but also chaos engineering and some and service level objectives. Oh, and uh, one quick note, uh, this, the illustrations on the slides are done by um done by uh emily griffin who is a artist in new york city who makes really amazing diagrams in my opinion cool um so let's talk about the problem domain what is it that honeycomb does and why should we care about reliability why should we care about service level objectives the answer is that um observability is a field that <clears throat> basically started about five or six years ago and has been rapidly evolving people are constantly innovating and figuring out what are we doing next? How are we helping people debug their uh, complex production systems faster? So what do we mean by observability? Why is it different from monitoring? I think the key difference is that people are able to debug unknown and known problems. They're able to debug things that they never would have been able to figure out any other way. And this ranges from being able to understand like a subset of your users are having a problem with a specific build. How do you find out which build it is and which subset of users at the same time? Because as those of us who live in Australia know, like it turns out that some people don't adequately test the behavior of what happens if your uh, if your connection to the to the remote server is more than 250 milliseconds. Um, so everything from narrowing down and slicing and dicing to find uh, problems in production to figuring out why is my build so slow and how do I get it on the right track, to how do I make my unit tests. Um, uh, how do I exercise my instrumentation, my unit test to make sure I can debug it both when my tests break and when things break in prod? Those are kind of the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. And yes, you can use tracing data or logging data or monitoring data or maybe even profiling data in the future, who knows, right? Like to try to find the answers to these problems, but the data itself doesn't necessarily give you those answers. You have to be able to produce that data in a way that makes sense to you, that's easy to you, and then you have to be able to store it and not have it break the bank, and then you have to be able to query it to understand what actually is happening inside of your systems. So that's what we think about every day at Honeycomb is how do we empower our clients to do that? And it turns out that in order to deliver on these things um, to, our, to our clients, we need to deliver a lot of features very quickly. And we need to provide a rock stable platform because if we're not there uh, when when you're having an outage, then you're going to have a harder time debugging that outage. 
And also we have to handle almost limitless uh, scale because many of our clients are some of the largest companies out there. Um, in particular, uh, you know, we have large financial services companies that rely upon us and there, and we have uh, Slack as a client, um, which we use every day in our remote work. So yeah, those are, those are things that very much, very much are top of mind. And we often feel in the field of DevOps and SRE, this tension between reliability and product velocity. And oh, by the way, did I mention that um, we're a team of 40 engineers um, that is competing with companies that have in, in the hundreds or thousands of engineers? So how do we do it? Well, the number one thing is we don't throw away four fifths of our work day and we don't throw away four fifths of our working week. Um, so we deploy on Fridays, uh, every single day of the work week, um, wherever people are lo physically located. And we try to not make people work on the weekends. And not only do we like deploy every single day of the week, we deploy up to 14 times per day. And that means that we have somewhere around the neighborhood of 40, uh, 40 commits that are going out uh, every, every single day. And the other thing that's really, really cool is that when we think about kind of this constant drumbeat of shipping, we practice um, this idea of self-ownership, that developers should be responsible for what they push because it makes them both more empowered and gives them more context about what's happening. So we think it's okay to push on Friday at 2 p.m. It's not okay to push on Friday at 5 p.m. or even Monday at 5 p.m., right? You don't uh, push code to production and walk out the door and say, bye-bye, on call, it's your problem. I'm going, I'm going to take a swim at Monday Beach now. Um, and did I mention we did this in the middle of the pandemic um, and also while well, traffic has gone up. Um, so this is the right workload coming into Honeycomb. Um, and you can see that that right workload in the course of a year has tripled. And similarly, the amount of read workload has, has tripled um, that people are issuing a lot of queries against, against your backend. So, what role do I have in Honeycomb? Um, I am in the interesting position of my official job title is developer advocate. So I speak to um, software developers and DevOps professionals like yourselves. Um, but I, I wind up uh, spending about 20% of my time being a practicing SRE at Honeycomb and kind of uh, putting myself in the shoes of people who are using Honeycomb or like who are trying to debug production problems. And, and then I also spend a lot of time kind of talking to people to figure out like, you know, what are the needs that we can bring back into the product and solve? Um, how, how, do we, how do we solve that problem? So um, how, do we, how do we address this problem of needing to ship a dozen times per day, of needing to um, have, you know, originally we had like 12 developers and now we have 40 developers. How do we get all of those changes out safely? And how do we, how do we sleep at night? Um, how, do we, how do we maintain the reliability of our services? So we do three things. First of all, we quantify reliability to kind of treat reliability as a product feature. I'll get to that in a moment. Secondly, we identify what might cause us to fall short, recognizing we're never going to capture everything that might cause us to fall short of our goals, but we can at least have some idea of failure modes that we can anticipate that we want to, to test in advance. And third, we actually design experiments to probe that risk. And we actually um, test to figure out whether or not we are, we are vulnerable to that risk. And then we prioritize going and fixing and cleaning up our technical debt, whether it's uncovered via an end planned outage or an end planned learning opportunity, or whether it's coming from uh, doing a game day or our chaos engineering experiment. So what do I mean by measuring reliability? So some of you may be familiar with, uh, with this concept from the Google Site Reliability Engineering book, but others of you may not um, because you know, we're always getting new people in the field. So um, would you mind giving me a reaction uh, in the Zoom? Uh, thumbs up if you've heard of SLOs, know what SLOs are. Thumbs down if you are newer to SLOs. Okay, looks like... Uh, Fair number of people know SLOs, so I'm just going to breeze through this really quickly. Um, so the goal of an SLO is to quantify how broken too broken is, recognizing that our services are always going to be failing in microscopic ways, 
And it doesn't necessarily matter that a single packet got dropped or that um, a single server flopped. That, that doesn't necessarily impact the experiences of enough customers for us to need to drop everything and address it. So SLOs help us address this problem by helping us resolve that tension of, you know, oh, you're moving too fast, you're breaking things too much, or, oh, you know, we need to move faster. Like, why are you holding me back? The system is perfectly stable. So there's actually not just the S3 book, there's now a specific book about SLOs by my uh, a former Google colleague, uh, Alex Hidalgo, that I highly recommend. Um, but the core idea is that it helps you get on the same page as the business about saying like, this is what our reliability needs to be as defined by our product management, as defined by our customers, by our sales teams, right? It helps us define, this is the target that we're aiming for. And in order to do this successfully, you really have to have uh, events in context. You have to have kind of the raw data about what your users are doing with your applications and what the properties of those requests are, right? What do they share in common? Things like, you know, which user it is, who's making the request, how long it took, which version of the service it went through and so forth. And then we can segment those into things that are good, bad, or, uh, or not applicable. Uh, specifically, we can figure out, you know, which things are, are a satisfactory user experience, um, you know, loads faster than half a second, uh, doesn't show me a bit giant error message, and in the case of Honeycomb, I can even get a little bit less abstract than that. I can say that Honeycomb's SLOs reflect the user workflows that our customers are trying to achieve, right? If our goal is to make your systems humane to run by ingesting your telemetry and answering your questions, well, we'd better actually be able to ingest your telemetry and answer your questions because otherwise you're not going to feel super empowered. So given that, you know, we kind of have to bring out the architecture diagram and zoom in a little bit um, to, to get a view into what's actually going on under, under the hood. So you have the client environments where people are running their applications, where they might be emitting telemetry of some kind, where telemetry might be a log or a trace or a metric, right? Some property of the system that you want us to measure for you. And that might get egressed as JSON, that might get egressed as gRPC protobufs, but in either case, like you're constantly streaming this data about your application so that you can resolve problems later down the road. And then after that, it has to get sucked into our data store, it needs to get persisted to AWS S3, and then you have to actually be able to query it. So all of our SLOs are designed around those key requirements. So for instance, if you try to uh, load the Honeycomb homepage, we expect that only one in a thousand times will it fail to load or load, load too slowly. Because that's a relatively predictable set of queries that we should have optimized to make reasonably fast, no matter how big your data set is. However, if you are asking us the question of arbitrary complexity, potentially spanning two months of data, we're not going to offer that same strong guarantee of you will get an answer in less than 250 milliseconds. What we'll say is about 99% you know, of the time, you'll get an answer within 10 seconds. And that kind of captures the idea that if you're trying to figure out what's going on really quickly. You probably want that to succeed with a very high probability. If you're interactively exploring and poking around at data, it might be okay for you to have to retry a query if it fails or something. But the number one thing that we really aim to not mess up for our customers is the ingest of their data. Because if you, are, if you uh, have an agent that is streaming data to us, that agent has a very finite buffer of memory. So at some point that buffer will, will fill up and if we can't receive that data, then that agent is going to have to drop, drop data, um, drop either the oldest or newest data. And that, can be, um, that can, be, can be kind of a problem because if, if that happens to every Honeycomb user, every Honeycomb user now will have, will have from, from now until the end of time, a permanent dip in their graphs. And that, that doesn't feel very good. So we treat the ingest of customer data very, very seriously. Um, so for the 99.9% .9 SLO, that's straightforward to do, right? Like, you know, that's 43 minutes of allowed downtime per month if you had a 100% outage. So that's enough time for a human being to respond and fix it if we do break something about our system. But what about that 49th SLO, right? That thing that says that 99.99% of events are processed without error in five milliseconds per event over a 30-day rolling window. That only gives us 4.3 minutes of potential downtime per month. That's not very much wiggle room. And our answer is to try to design our systems that they are redundant so that even if they fail, they partially fail, 
and so that they um, and and so that we are able to recover them with automation as much as possible, so we don't need human intervention. So, for instance, if you are um, having a one percent outage of a service that's allowed to be uh, down for four minutes at full downtime, that means you have four hundred minutes to respond to a one percent outage before you make enough of your users unhappy that they that they notice and become frustrated with you. But there are other trade-offs that we can make. For instance, we can decide, should we invest in more reliability or should we, uh, or do we have plenty of reliability budget left over? Why don't we spend that to do some experiments? And I think that if you don't spend your full error budget, you're doing yourself a disservice. You're either failing to ship product as quickly as you could, or you're failing to use that error, leftover error budget to do experiments that bound your future risks. You can continue to stay in the good graces of your error budget. The other thing I find super empowering about, uh, about SLOs is that they measure customer experience, which means that you no longer have to alert on things like, you know, what's the CPU utilization of this one host? It no longer matters. You won't get woken up by it transiently going up to 90% because you're taking the backup, right? Instead, you can only alert if you are in imminent danger of exceeding your error budget. So how do you actually manage to that SLO and stay with an SLO? Um, I think the key people who have done the most research into this are the folks uh, who wrote Accelerate, uh, which is one of the seminal uh, dev books about DevOps. And those folks wrote a uh, report that basically outlines the, you know, the state of DevOps. What are the kind of four key factors that, um, that people need to do and how well are they actually doing at it? So I have this population of low performing teams stuck in the legacy monolithic world that are deploying less often than once for six months. And therefore, anything that they might commit to source control takes more than six months before it even reaches the first customer. And if there is a problem, therefore, sometimes it can take people up to six months to figure out what's going on with a service degradation. And they have somewhere between 15 and 30% of their changes fail in a way that requires human intervention. On the opposite end of the ecosystem, kind of the happy path, right? It's people who are deploying on demand the instant a change is, is committed to source control, who have it take less than an hour for that change to then make it out to production. And if there is some kind of problem, changes are not expensive to, to revert or otherwise deal with if they've caused problems. So what you'll notice, the change fail rate does not meaningfully go down between, uh, high, between medium and high performers or high and elite performers. You can be a high performer and still 15% of your changes require follow-up. The difference is that you've lowered the cost of failure so that it no longer becomes disruptive to your customers if you're having these problems. What low performing teams think that they're doing by kind of introducing this long feedback loop and exhaustive testing is, you know, we're going to try to ring out all the changes early on before a single customer sees them. But we know that DevOps is about agile practices. DevOps is about feedback loops, about kind of pushing things forward as much as possible so you get rapid feedback and can iterate. So that's kind of how we think that a better model towards service reliability and velocity. And that's what we practice every day when we think about our own software delivery cycle. We've also seen some of these factors in, in what our customers do as well. So the first thing and most important thing that we do is that we instrument as we code, right? No one would even uh, think today of, of you know, checking things in and being like, oh, I'll just write the unit test later. Or, no, we don't need unit tests at all. Like it's fine, right? Like you don't do that anymore. So in the same vein, why should our code that's checked into source control not already have instrumentation? And by instrumentation, what I mean typically is wide events. It's data that come that is about every request flowing through each service in our system and metadata about it, like which user was issuing the query, how long did it take, um, which backends did it hit, uh, what, who called what. Those are all important pieces that you need to make sure you capture with good instrumentation uh, going, going along the way. Secondly, we practice functional and visual testing, but it's fully automated and it's not done with things like Selenium. Instead, what we do is snapshot based testing off of the document object model, which helps keep our tests fast and not flaky while still preserving a high degree of confidence that we're not regressing anything. Third, as I mentioned, you can move a lot faster if you are able to deploy things 1% at a time rather than 100% of the time. And if you can roll back within milliseconds rather than taking hours to revert a build. And then third, we also think about how do we actually practice reviews? 
So humans prioritize doing reviews at Honeycomb. If you ping someone a Slack message saying, hey, this, this, um, this code review is holding me up, they'll get it turned around within an hour. Our builds take less than 15 minutes to complete. And anytime it starts approaching 15 minutes, we start taking the uh, circle CI parallelism hammer to whack it back into shape. And we trust the combination of human review, including human review of did you write the appropriate instrumentation, as well as the automated review to say that if the build is green and you have approval, you can merge it to main. And once it's merged to main, it'll go out with the next hourly release. And that hourly release is automatically promoted between environments. If there is a problem, there are some ways that we can deal with it without necessarily causing a giant fire drill. Okay. I lied. It wasn't actually the most important thing to write the instrumentation. The most important thing is to look at the results of that instrumentation, to observe behavior in production. So, oops, this still has a US spelling and hilarious. Um, so when we observe behavior in production, what this means is that we look at right after something goes out, uh, kind of how it works, um, what it, the impact it had on latency, um, kind of the impact it had on usage, did it behave the way that we expected it to? And if not, right, like what's our plan? Are we rolling it back? Or are we monitoring it for a while? And kind of if it, things do go wrong, making sure we understand who is impacted, right? To be able to break down and understand which section of code is tickling this bug and who is encountering it. We also have implemented some of these continuous delivery practices with our infrastructure, not just with our product code. So for instance, we use extensive, uh, extensively Terraform and Chef, and they are infrastructure's code tools that enable us to have really great CI for our infrastructure code and allow us to even have feature flagging for infrastructure code. So for instance, it's a config parameter that you can very easily tweak to turn on and off uh, a, an ephemeral fleet that might be used for catch up or might be used for quarantining bad traffic. And when you're done with it, you just set the value back to zero and it automatically is deleted and removed from circulation, which is kind of cool. But all this sounds very great, right? Like it kind of helps us maintain that context in our heads, but how do we make sure that these redundancy mechanisms that we've built in, how do we make sure that they actually work the way that we think they do? So I said earlier, if you are having leftover error budget and you're not spending it, that is, in my opinion, a little bit of a waste. Um, it's definitely, hold on a second. Um, sorry about that. My sister-in-law is uh, messaging me because we're in theory going out to the movies in an hour and a half, but uh, that may not be happening with the rain. If, if people have washing that they need to bring in, I'm looking at mine very forlornly at the moment. Um, now might be a good time to do it because the rain is coming and it is heavy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely do that. You do not want to dry your laundry a second time. Okay. So, um, so you can experiment with your error, with your leftover error budget. Um, if you have greater than you know, if we have greater than ninety nine point nine nine percent availability, we're going to put that to work in order to figure out what the limits of our systems are. But when we talk about chaos engineering, we do not mean pure and bridled chaos. We don't mean like doing things without a goal in mind, right? What you're instead trying to do is to figure out what is the hypothesis that you're trying to test and then how are you going to test it? Um, so, and you always want an off button, right? How do you ensure safety? How do you make sure that, um, how do you make sure that you have the ability to stop an experiment gone wrong from blowing through your entire error budget? Is there some kind of emergency off button? So feature flags, again, super useful. You can run an experiment on only 1% of your users. That gives you a lot more maneuvering room. So one area that we thought that we wanted to practice um, chaos engineering on first was the data persistence inside of Honeycomb. So this is the, again, architecture diagram, a little bit more fine grained than the high level one I showed you earlier. Right? We've kind of got a stateless tier of services where we can restart them on demand. We also have services where it's a lot, a little bit more work if we lose that AWS instance that was holding the data. In particular, we run Kafka and we run a, our own proprietary data store called Retriever. And those need to, you know, we cannot lose our data. That is our one job. So how do we handle this? The answer is every Kafka copy of data coming into Kafka is replicated three times. And every copy of data is also replicated twice in Retriever. 
So what this means is an event comes into the stateless service and then each event is sprayed across many different Kafka partitions. Each Kafka partition is an ordered stream of events backed by three distinct Kafka brokers. And then our indexing workers read off of the end of those partition queues and they assemble a uh, deconstructed set of indices. Instead of having you know, event, you know, uh, event row, column, 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 Instead, we have column, row, 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 column, row, 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 row. So we switch it to a column-based data store. But we have to make sure that that data is consistent and that once it's been read off of Kafka, that it's safe to delete. And then finally, we archive all that data to S3 after it's been a couple of hours. So what can go wrong here? Well, number one, AWS instance uh, issues happen rarely enough that they're, that they're not frequently tested if you just leave AWS to its own devices but they happen often enough that you really should plan for them. So we wanted to verify that we could tolerate uh, loss of our instances and that we are designing our systems to be more and more reliable over time rather than have our system scale up from, you know, sure, you can manually operate five pairs of instances. Turns out manually operating 10 or 15 or 20 or now we're up to 70 pairs of instances and keeping them perfectly flying information, that's hard. So for instance, we wanted to validate if we lose a Kafka broker, you know, are we able to spin up a brand new Kafka broker and replace it via replication? Do we have enough slack room in our system to do that? Or if we lose an indexing worker, are we able to get the snapshot from its peer or from S3 and then replay from the place where the snapshot was taken forward in the, in the uh, ordered event queue? So how do we do this? Well, it turns out the best way is actually kill instances, experiment in production, because it's going to happen to you whether you like it or not. You may as well make it happen at 3 p.m. rather than 3 a.m. But you don't want to introduce too much chaos at once, so maybe don't restart Kafka and Zookeeper and, and your indexing servers at the same time, right? One server, one service at one time, and at 3 p.m., not 3 a.m., so that all hands are available in case something goes wrong, at least initially. And this really speaks to this idea from open source that bugs are shallow with more eyes, that the more people you have kind of keeping an eye on things, the more ideas that you have in the room about how to fix them and what's going on. I mentioned earlier the idea of service level objectives, right? Our system should be able to tolerate any single node failure without even having a single blip of our service level indicator. And in no case should our service level objective burn fully from too many failed SLI events. And in the event that you do encounter something that looks weird, whether it just be a few events that fail the SLI that, but that don't rise to the level of the whole SLO violation, or if you do have something that is a wider outage, you want to be able to debug and having sufficient observability into your system really matters. And especially in our case, testing the telemetry matters too, right? To make sure that you have the right graphs. You're running this experiment. Wouldn't it be nice if you had in your lab notebook, this is how I'm going to verify what happened, right? This is how I'm going to verify that my experiment was a success here are the quick buttons I'm going to press in order to check to see whether, whether that's working the way they expected. So once we've done that manually a couple of times, we actually encountered issues, we fixed them, and then we repeated the process. And we've wound up repeating it so often that it's now fully automatic and we just replace one node of this type and of this type every single week on, on Mondays and Tuesdays. So one of the problems that we found, for instance, was that, you know, sure, uh, you lose, uh, you know, you lose an indexing worker, or you lose the Kafka, uh, Kafka worker. What happens if the tier of the indexing worker is down at the same time? What happens if you lose two indexing workers from the same partition? It turns out for some, for the first three years of Honeycomb, we were just relying on, you know, we're going to try to make sure they run in different availability zones and hope we don't lose it the same, both at the same time. Now we have a much more systematic strategy of using. Uh, of using file system snapshots and uploading them to S3 so that even if we lose both workers in the same partition, we're okay. Here's another fun one. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, your uh, alerts uh, are, are evaluated once per minute and exactly once per minute. So we use Zookeeper to manage that. Except for one time, I restarted our Zookeeper, one node in our Zookeeper cluster and suddenly no, uh, no alerts went off. It turns out that all of our alerting workers, they, they were using Zookeeper to kind of do consensus, but they weren't actually talking to all three of the nodes in the Zookeeper cluster. Oops. 
So we fixed that, and now the alerting workers can survive the restart of a single zookeeper node. Yay, yay for testing. So yeah, as I said, de-risk with design and automation. Why is it that we should have to uh, tolerate having individual, uh, you know, not be able to tolerate two of the same kind of worker going away? No, upload it to S3 and you're done, much better. And when you restart continuously during working hours, that verifies two things. Number one, that you have the capacity to survive a failure event during working hours when typically the traffic is highest. And number two, you're available to respond if there is a problem. And once you've made this systematic, and you know, even if you're restarting nodes once per week, if it's not a storage node, if it's a stateless worker, why not just let Amazon restart it on demand anytime it feels like, and to put you on the most efficient instances at any given moment. So that's what we've done with a bunch of our workload is that it's been migrated to AWS spot instances because we know it can tolerate interruption. And therefore we've been able to move it to, uh, and just tell AWS run this on the most efficient and cheapest hardware right now. And if it needs to preempt us, it'll do it and it won't impact our SLOs. We've also been able to carry out gradual migrations of basically everything here. Actually Doodle got moved, I think last week um, onto ARM64 which is a processor architecture that is available, for instance, via uh, Oracle or Packet um, slash Equinix Metal uh, with the Ampere instances or from Amazon with its Graviton2 instances. And these instances consume less power and have lower loss licensing costs. And that has enabled us to, you know, because we were able to experiment and move nodes over and restart them one at a time and try out a new instance type that we might not have otherwise been able to try if we hadn't had kind of confidence in our ability to replace instances, right? Like this has enabled us to save something like 40% on our EC2 bill. And that's what that actually looks like. It's, um, it is pretty significant. Um, it made such a numerical difference to Honeycomb that it actually materially impacted our finances as, as a Series B startup at the time and helped us raise our Series C round to have such good cost of goods sold. But unfortunately, not every experiment is going to succeed. So let's talk about risk mitigation. Let's talk about kind of what we did when we blew our SLOs due to uh, running the wrong, running uh, experiments that went badly. Um, yeah, so first of all, let's talk about our ingest service. Um, so Shepard is our ingest service that handles kind of all incoming traffic. Um, and therefore it's the highest traffic service, but it's stateless. You can kind of restart it on demand. It's kind of a throughput oriented service where we care about getting the most data sucked in as quickly as possible. And in December of 2020, uh, we were in the process of migrating from our proprietary API, which uses uh, basically gzipped encoded JSON. And we needed to switch to a broader industry standard called open telemetry, which both we and many of our, com our competitors take. But it's a service that uses gRPC as the transport mechanism rather than HTTP and JSON. So what we did was uh, in November of 2020, uh, we accidentally allowed a commit to go out that tried to bind to a privileged port. And it worked fine in our developer workstations and in those containers, but it catastrophically failed when it reached production. We did have some processes to be able to really quickly stop the deploy from reaching any additional hosts. But what the problem was that happened was that any previously started instances were repeatedly trying to run the binary that was failing to start up. And not only that, the, that meant that the instances that were left that had not yet switched over to the new build, those ones were under increasing traffic. And AWS's uh, auto scaling group shot us in the foot here. Because what AWS saw was half of your instances are, un are using no CPU. That means they're underutilized. Let's shut down half of the instances. And AWS wasn't picking the half of the instances that had zero percent utilization. They just shut down half of the instances. So we were losing more and more and more capacity. And unfortunately, this took more than 10 minutes to remediate, and that blew our SLO because our SLO is, you know, no more than 99, uh, you know, no more than 0.1 percent of, of uh, 0.01 of queries can fail, um, and we impacted 100 percent of our traffic. So that was not good. Um, so what do you do? The Google SRA book says freeze the deploys, right? Like that. It's kind of this panacea for like if you're having any problems with stability, uh, freeze production. We actually view it as important to not like halt everything, 
if you already are deploying to production every single hour on the hour, it's more disruptive to stop that process rather than to uh, rather than, than to, to keep to keep it going. But what we did do is we decided we we're going to focus the team's efforts on reliability for a little while. That we we're going to focus the team's efforts on making it safer to roll this out in the future so that we could then proceed. We also did consider uh, delaying the launch, but it was an important launch involving AWS as a partner in terms of the open telemetry ecosystem. So we said, okay, no, like we think we can find a way to make this work, but if we have another failure or if we don't think we can mitigate the risk, then we'll definitely delay the launch. So something like 99.999% of our traffic coming in was the standard HTTP JSON protocol. But what we did was we stood up an entirely separate copy of the stack on which we could freely experiment so that if we did have a bug that caused instances to crash, it wouldn't cause a problem. If we didn't have a bug that caused, um, that caused instances to crash in startup, it wouldn't be a problem, right? And we had the load balancer use the content type to decide which set of instances it was sending to. That way we could experiment on the less than 0.1% uh, of traffic that was coming in that was, uh, that was a new protocol while leaving the existing traffic alone on its existing infrastructure. So that's how we resolved that crisis and we launched in January on time. Um, and we've had open telemetry support uh, natively since January of 2021. Okay, uh, failure mode number two. So as I said earlier, Kafka is our data bus. Kafka gives us durability and it allows us to decouple things, right? It lets, means that Shepard doesn't have to be stateful. It means that Retriever is stateful, but you can restart it and have it catch up for an offset. So this is kind of cool. So we are in the process of optimizing our use of, of Kafka. And in particular, we had outgrown some of our existing Kafka setup. We are running a very large number of, um, uh, of instance storage, uh, I3EN instances with local SSD. And we were using them basically for the disk storage to store 24 hours of data in case we had some kind of catastrophic failure that required us to replay a day of data. Guess what? It turns out that we were almost never accessing 24 hours of data. Heck, we were not even accessing three hours or two hours of data. We we're accessing one hour of data to replay from the hourly snapshot forward. That was the scenario that we we're regularly using. We were paying for 30 times as much SSD as we actually needed. So we talked to Confluent and they recommended using tiered storage to us, which kind of offloads some of the Kafka payloads onto AWS S3 and will retrieve them on demand if you are having, if you ask for the data back via the same API. We said, hey, this is great. Why don't we also, in addition to switching to tiered storage, why don't we switch to faster, cheaper instance types, right? Why don't we switch to, hey, we found this ARM64 thing. It's really cool. Why don't we try that? Um, and it turns out that this did not go according to plan. We changed too many dimensions at once. In particular, we exhausted limits of the amount of SSD capacity to talk to the uh, AWS Elastic Block Store because we were no longer having local instance store for the most recent hour of data. And it turns out we overloaded that capacity, um, that bandwidth between the uh, instance and the disk. We also then blew out the network capacity. It turns out that um, unless you get an instance that is a, a N instance with the N on the end, it is not a provision of extra network bandwidth. And when you squish what was 30 machines of network bandwidth onto six machines of network bandwidth, you better have the network capacity available. And lastly, and finally, we are starting to have mysterious issues where we would be restoring a new node and the new node would come up, start replicating data in, and it would suddenly get terminated. And we're like, did you touch it? No, I didn't touch it. Did you touch it? No. Why is AWS saying that the instance was terminated? It turns out that this was you know, a brand new set of instances, a brand new version of AWS's Nitro hypervisor, and it had a bug. It had a bug that would cause the instance to go unresponsive and, and, get, knocked out of, and get knocked out of the EC2. So in the end of the day, we decided, you know what? Our goal here is just to tier the data to S3. We don't need to simplify, we don't need to kind of refactor anything else. We can just change, you know, uh, from, from more instances of one type to fewer instances of that same type without changing any of these other variables. We never actually technically blew our SLO here in terms of, of the uh, response availability. But what we did blow was that our people were feeling burnt out by this. And therefore we realized that we needed to back off. We needed to 
pause this change and go about it more thoughtfully. And that we needed to reinforce and remind people, it's okay to say like, hey, like I need help, right? Like I'm not up to doing this. Uh, no one's gonna penalize for you for this, right? Like we all want to help each other succeed, which means that like, if you're wobbling, like hand off some of your load to someone else. And also to kind of take care of your own needs, right? To make sure that you're fed, that you're well hydrated, um, to kind of make, make sure that, that if you are working an incident, like you shouldn't have to worry about dinner and childcare at the same time. And lastly, kind of, especially um, this week, I also had a blip involving Kafka where something that I thought was going to be simple uh, took, you know, three to, to nine times what I thought it would. Um, you know, yes, moving test is important, but also making sure that you are budgeting for what if it does go wrong, as opposed to just what if it goes right. So the final kind of war story that I want to tell is, uh, is about our uh, storage system. So our storage system um, relies on tiering data that's older than maybe the past hour to AWS S3, and then massively processing it in parallel with AWS Lambda. And turns out that, whoa, that is some phenomenal lightning outside. That is uh, very spectacular. But also, I don't think I'm going to the movies tonight. That is not happening. Um, so <clears throat> Lambda, massively parallel processing, right? Like you can borrow AWS's end used cores and run 30,000 worker nodes in parallel reading, reading data off of S3. Really cool. The problem is that as more and more of our customers started becoming addicted to these kind of less than five second queries and months of data, our costs started ex exploding. And we were wondering, what can we do about it? Well, what if we switch to, uh, to again, like Graviton is great. What if we switch to Graviton to powered lambdas? So I initially, uh, so instead of doing a switch like all at once, I switched over with the feature flag. I said 50% of new invocations should be started on the uh, new architecture and 50% on the old architecture. And it turns out I had to roll it back very, very quickly. I could immediately see that the latency had degraded by a factor of, of two to three times. And that was not acceptable. Um, but I was able to roll it back and roll it back to still trickle 1% of traffic so I could kind of smoke test that everything was still working on the new architecture with continuous load, while also not imperiling the performance of too many honeycomb queries. That's what that looks like, right? Literally, 648, flip the flag, 648, the, the data has, has, left the old, has left the new system that didn't work out. And it turns out that um, we were able to slowly increase the proportion of traffic. And uh, we've actually now been in communication with AWS and they've confirmed the issue that we saw was a uh, capacity issue. So because again, we've done this with future flags, we've been able to increase from 1% to 5% to 10% to 20 to 30. And hopefully in the coming weeks and months, we'll be able to increase all the way up to 100% now that they've communicated with us about our utilization of tens of thousands of parallel worker nodes. Cool, so, wrap, so let's wrap things up. You can be both fast and reliable. You just need to think about what are the right practices that will support people in doing both. So we can't bolt on reliability at the very end. We have to design for reliability th through our full life cycle. And that you can use feature flags even if you have a really tight SLO um, by making sure that you have the ability to rapidly roll things back or to impact only a small percent of users at a time. But even if you can't, you can do really creative things like partitioning your traffic um, at the infrastructure level or at the tenant level. And that when you spread out that risk, it improves customer experience because no longer do they have like 100% of their stuff failing. At worst, 1% of their stuff will fail and they'll have to click retry. But at the end of the day, the SLO is not carved in stone. It's a guideline, not a rule. Black Swan events happen. For instance, we had, right, like, I'm sure almost all of us worked on, on the log4j remediation, right? Log4j happened. We had to restart all of our Kafka workers in very quick succession, right? If I had blown my SLO from restarting Kafka too quickly, it would be something that I'd be like, okay, that was an end scheduled learning experience. We're going to learn from it, but also we're not going to freeze deploys, right? Like we had to roll, you know, we had to roll out that, that Kafka release or else we would have potentially done something worse than violate reliability promises. You can never, ever, ever violate security promises. Prioritize taking down your system rather than having it breached. But what do I, right, like black swans, they happen. Uh, vendor code and architecture, yep, uh, that, that high, high log4j. Um, but also, it's always DNS. It's always SSL certificates. So what's your plan for dealing with those? How are you going to find out what goes wrong? 
And once you have a mature, robust chaos engineering practice and good SLOs, and you have an idea of how close to the edge you're operating, you can make joking or maybe even not so joking uh, talks about deploying the chaos monkeys and setting them loose and saying, you know what, I'm just going to uh, uh, SSH through all of my hosts and restart one for 20 minutes and see what happens. So uh, outages and failed experiments, don't punish them over it, right? Like learn from them and you'll have a much healthier, healthier culture. So talk to each other, put customers first, we're all on the same team. Uh, that's what I have for you today. Thank you very much. Uh, if you want the slides, uh, go to honeycomb.io slash Liz. Um, and also we have a blog there, uh, honeycomb.io slash blog. And I also have a book coming out, uh, O'Reilly Observability Engineering, and you can get a free copy uh, thanks to my employer. So Questions, folks? That's fantastic, Liz. Thank you so much. Um, feel free to unmute and ask questions. I'm sure you can all work out how to do it orderly. Uh, otherwise, if you uh, don't feel confident speaking up, feel free to pop a question in the chat and I will very happily read it out as well. Well, maybe you stunned everybody, Liz, or maybe uh, the Lightning has uh, knocked out everybody's internet. <laughs> nobody's nobody's actually here anymore. Oh, there we go. We've got a couple of people popping up in the chat. So we've got Rashad uh, asking, "Have you ever used Chaos Monkey Pod?" Oh, and Liz, you are muted. Sorry, my my bad. Oh, sorry. Um, we don't because uh, we're just starting our Kubernetes migration. Only about half of our services are migrated to Kubernetes right now in production. Um, we've migrated almost everything our uh, pre-prod kind of uh, what observes our production environment. Um, we call it Dogwood. Half of that's my or all of the Dogwood is migrated. Half of production is migrated, but we're worried that Chaos Monkey is not going to know how to enforce the constraints of knowing when is and isn't safe to proceed with restarts, like if we're doing another restart. Um, and we're also concerned about the fact that. Um, you know, we aim to do experiments with a hypothesis in mind, and just setting Chaos Monkey loose at random times doesn't really comport with that idea for us that we want to have a hypothesis before you do things. Awesome. Uh, we've got Rashad who said thanks. We've also got uh, Art who's popped up and said, amazing, great presentation, Liz, and Kristen saying, just want to say thank you, Liz, awesome presentation. Right, any other questions, feel free to unmute and ask or uh, pop them in the chat and I will relay them. Yeah, I don't mind turning my camera on and unmuting. Um, Go for it. Hi, Lindsay, by the way, good to see you. It's been a minute. Uh, thanks for the talk, Liz, it was really good. Uh, I got a page full of notes here. So I am an observability engineer over at Safety Culture, which is probably not too far from where you are at the moment. Uh, we're currently going through a bit of an overhaul uh, in observability um, mm -hmm. because we, I guess at the moment you would call it monitoring more than observability and we're really trying to make that transition. Um, so my question is, do you have any, in your experience in this field, do you have any tried and true methods for communicating and teaching engineering teams kind of the soft skills and the mindset behind observability? Because what I've found very quickly in this journey is it's easy to teach people a tool set and how to use a, an interface, but it's much harder to teach people why they should care about SLOs and error budgets and you know, kind of the, the yeah, mind. I, th I think it's, um, it's two things. With regard to SLOs and error budgets, the bottom line is focusing on customer experience, right? To emphasize that it is a better way to measure the real customer experience and not just what you think you're measuring about customer experience. Um, so kind of what I discovered when I came to Honeycomb was that, and also my time at Google, is that people like were used to be very confused about SLOs, right? Like they'd be like, great, I'll look at, I'll put this on a wall and I'll look at it once a quarter. But there wasn't this kind of interactive real-time feedback of my error budget goes off um, and then I, I get an alert and I'm able to debug it. That was the number and stum stumbling block because people didn't have a connection between user having a bad time, the SLO going off, to those transactions were bad, those specific transactions were bad, where did they go bad, right? So I think that's why SLOs and observability go really good together because they enable you to start from the high level um, symptom of user pain and trace it all the way down to the reason why it broke, as opposed to what everyone else has been doing, which is ours backwards, right? Which is to start from, you know, hey, these are all these individual hosts. We're going to monitor every single host and we'll get alerted if any one host goes wrong. Guess what? You get woken up 15 times per week. It's not great. Um, 
So kind of getting people to think about it, customer, and then narrowing it down as opposed to bottoms up and, and super noisy, that's kind of the way to, to get that kind of fast low culture in place. The other thing that I've seen is that people have been afraid to use their tools before, right? They're like, is this going to cost me money or is this going to be super slow? Or the last time I ran a Splunk query that took 10 minutes, someone yelled at me because I was using all the capacity in the Splunk cluster and, and things got really slow for everyone, right? If it's painful or expensive or slow to run queries, people don't run queries, right? You want to encourage people to, you want to encourage people to feel like they can ask their system questions and kind of be in this dialogue and refine and iterate, right? Rather than just, you know, either I have the answer on a dashboard or I don't. Yeah, thanks so much. It's really helpful. Got a question, Ben. Um, there is one question in the chat um, saying, wonderful presentation, Liz. Um, can you please suggest some links for benchmarks done against managed Kafka service and Kafka on EC2? Yes. Um, so our belief is that AWS is cheating with, um, with, with their managed Kubernetes, uh, with their managed Kafka service. They are not charging themselves network uh, costs between Kafka brokers and different AZs. Um, so that kind of distorts the whole conversation unless you can talk to your Amazon account rep about solving this problem of paying for extortionate fees for uh, network transit between AZs. Um, like, yeah, the, the, thing, the thing is that at one point, this may even be still be true today. Um, our network costs were basically three times what we were actually spending on instances that the, the, the network between the compute nodes. Um, so in general, unless you are us and you're trying to run a service that is like four nines based off of Kafka, you can probably get away with using a managed service and it'll be both cheaper and more reliable. Um, and you don't have to worry about scaling it. But our experience was that, um, you know, we're trying to run a four nine service. Uh, most of the managed services will only offer you three nines of, of, avail of guaranteed availability of your Kafka, which is not, not great. Um, so we've chosen to commit to developing that expertise in conjunction with uh, having Confluent help us and give us training and kind of collaborate with us on features like tiered storage. Um, but yeah, I've actually, if you go to honeycomb.io slash blog, you'll see my latest benchmarks of the new IM4GN um, Graviton storage instances and running Kafka on them. Um, I don't directly compare to uh, to Amazon Kafka service, um, but you can kind of extrapolate from there. Um, the kind of numbers I cite as far as like messages per second, bandwidth per second, and how few hosts we're able to run on. Awesome. Thanks, Liz. Um, it's more of a comment than a question, but uh, Matt Hoper said that uh, he's been using SLO slash error budgets at work product owners to help illustrate and prioritize addressing technical debt. Uh, we also have another question there from Paco Lua, um, and they say, thanks for the great talk, Liz. I kind of feel it's really a philosophical and cultural edge that Honeycomb is building up in the engineering team. Is this true? And how did you guys do that? We did it from day zero, right? Like our thesis about observability and empowering engineering teams, that was kind of the reason why our founders, Sherry and Christine, started the company in the first place. So our initial kind of team of engineers, which was Sherry and Christine working in a garage together, right? Um, and then like, right, like we kind of grew from there of like, we know that this is the end state of people being inquisitive, people feeling psychologically safe, right? Like that kind of organically grew. The one piece I will say is that I brought SLOs to Honeycomb for the first time. Uh, no one at, at Honeycomb had thought about SLOs as a thing that applied to them. They were like, oh, that's just a Google thing that only applies to big companies. It's like, no, let me show you how to, how to do this and change the way that we think about operations and alerting at Honeycomb. Um, so people are also willing to embrace change, right? Like if there's a change in practices, people wholeheartedly embrace it. But it starts kind of from having that high degree of autonomy and trust. Thanks, Liz. Uh, and there's one last question here. I'm going to call. Uh, Tim, off. did you want to end me and ask that live? Yeah, I saw you raise your hand. So. Uh, yeah, actually, it's like there's an argument saying that logging is helpful for debugging, but it's just as good as the developer think about the scenario like that. So then you come with the auto instrumentation. This will kind of discover the unknown, unknown problem. But Auto instrumentation is kind of limited in some scenario, like some organization, they have some kind of in-house library and it's not so support, well supported. Then the path is kind of developer, they will, will just go with the manual instrumentations. 
So do you think that with the manual instrumentation, it will have the same problem as the logging? Like it's just as good as the person doing that? Yeah, so I think that you have to start with automatic instrumentation to kind of get the skeleton, right, of what services exist in the first place, what RPCs are they calling on each other, what endpoints exist, um, and kind of to get that trace propagation running through. Mm -hmm. After that, manual instrumentation is kind of up to your own taste. The number one thing that I recommend is kind of to make sure that you are attaching attributes to existing trace spans, not, you know, forking off new trace spans willy-nilly, right? If you're structuring your data and ensuring that there's as few trace spans as possible, right? Because the tracing framework takes care of collecting all of that together. You don't have these disconnected scattered log lines, right? There are, you know, one log line here, one log line here, all pertaining to the same request, right? One entry per service uh, per, per request. And I think when you structure your data, right? When you have these key value pairs, sure. A large enough organization you care about kind of having consistency. I was actually talking to some folks at Atlassian about this, right? Like about their kind of desire to have a consistent, um, a, a consistent, consistent semantic convention, right? Do we call it HTTP.route, HTTP.target, right? Mm -hmm. Things like that, right? Like you kind of have to make sure that that's standard and that things are always broken into machine readable payloads rather than, you know, just a human readable message. Yeah, thanks. Uh, oh, and one last thing, uh, auto instrumentation. Some auto instrumentation is counterproductive or unhelpful. I'm in particular looking at Redis auto instrumentation. Uh, Redis is like horribly, horribly chatty. And by default, if you're measuring every Redis call, like you're going to have tons of garbage flowing into your and flowing, flowing in and creating trace spans. Every time it confirms a transaction, that's, that's one message like and every time it tries to read a cache value, that's one message. It's like, no, the reason I have a cache is because I don't want to care about about miss about hits. I only want to care about misses, right? So, hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's if. Uh, sorry, if I may ask the one follow up questions. Yeah. Um, actually, that's the problem I face because we used auto instrumentation, and the platform that we are using is Datadog. So there's a sampling involved. So the auto instrumentation library normally produce a lot, and then we miss the most important one due to the sampling. Ah, uh, yes, uh, yes. The way that you solve that is by consistent tail sampling. Um, if you're doing scattershot sampling, that will break your traces, right? That will break hmm. the connection, causal connection between your events if your parent doesn't exist because it was sampled away. So you need to make sure that it's sampled all or nothing, right? Either you get the whole trace or you drop the whole trace. Yep. That requires an additional service to buffer the data. Um, so there are a couple of solutions. Open Telemetry Collector does is starting to have a tail sampler, although it's not uh, a tail sampler that is scales past one Open Telemetry Collector, but at least that exists. And at Honeycomb, at least, we've built our own spin on that. That is a clustered tail sampler that will buffer traces for up to one minute, make the sampling decision, and then keep all of it or drop all of it, which kind of solves that problem of broken traces and missing context. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Oh, one other thing about auto, uh, about sampling while I'm on that subject. Um, the other thing is like you don't blindly sample, you know, one one for a hundred. Uh, you can say if I've never seen this key before, right? If I've never seen this message before, keep it. But if I have seen it, you know, a million times, sample it one for a thousand, right? You can do dynamic sampling on the basis of the frequency with which the key happens to make sure that you don't miss rare events. So these are solvable problems. It's just that um, you know varying uh, players in the space may or may not have solved them. Yep. Yeah, thanks. We've got one last question stuck in um, from David Lamb in the chat. David, feel free to unmute if you want. Otherwise, I'm happy to ask a question on your behalf. Yeah, I was, I was just asking about um, hard cutovers, like versions and, and, and like very important infrastructure like Kafka. Yeah. Um, so the interesting thing here is that I'll go back over here. Okay. So so the thing with, with Kafka is that Kafka is tolerant of losing one broker at a time. Um, so you can actually perfectly reasonably take down a broker and even do an in-place upgrade, right, without throwing away the whole disk contents. When we do our planned replacements, we even throw away the whole disk, but you don't have to do that here uh, if you're just doing a version upgrade. So you basically, um, you know, we will unpack and install the new uh, Debian file from Confluent. Uh, we'll automatically restart the service, uh, taking a Zookeeper lock out to say, hey, I'm in the middle of an upgrade. No one else restart at the same time. 
and then it'll come back up and it'll resume communicating to the other brokers. But the conflict documentation, which we strongly agree with, recommends doing it in a two pass approach. First, you upgrade the brokers to the new package version one broker at a time. Then after that, you do a second change that updates the config to have to cause them to speak the new protocol to each other. Right? There, there is a distinction in Kafka uh, between the protocol version that brokers speak to each other. And you know, each broker is capable of understanding at least the protocol version of the one that's one less recent than itself. Um, so two rolling resources is the answer uh, gated, gated by Zookeeper. Cool. OK. But I'm also kind of thinking, so what I've seen, but I haven't played with it, the Zookeeper is going. And um, I guess that, I guess but it's more about the, um, the, if the, if the data underneath doesn't have to change, then maybe you can do the upgrades. But uh, if, yep. say, for example, the infrastructure had to change and it, it, it required a different different format on disk or something that had to be a hard Oh, hard, in that case, over. you utilize your, your whole node replacement process, right? That you have a mechanism to replicate in from another source. So you yeah, can right. do the data conversion as you read the new data from, from the new source. Yep, OK, cool. We also occasionally have done this. I think with um, we can drain if we really need to. We could drain all of our data from writing to a particular Kafka partition and just retire that Kafka partition if we needed to. We've never had to do it, but um, we will at least transiently drain uh, partitions that we know are bad. Awesome. Well, we might call it time there. Um, still with Roland. Yay, Rob. I'm glad that you've had fun adding instrumentation. It is kind of like solving the murder mystery. It's wonderful. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thank you all for having me. This was super fun. Yeah, thank you again, Liz. Uh, really appreciate your talk. And um, uh, for folks that are inspired by this and want to be able to share it with their colleagues, we'll have the recording up. Uh, I'm going to aim for about midday tomorrow. So you can uh, share that in your in your work slacks in the afternoon. A little bit of uh, little bit of light viewing right there. <laughs> All right, well, where are the tails stretch of this? Uh, just a quick recap of the events that I talked about or, or were mentioned in the chat before. So we've got the DevOps conference that's happening on March 8 and 9, that's online. Uh, and the time zone conversion there is 7 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. Uh, AEDT. <laughs> so if you're a night owl, this is the conference for you. Uh, check it out at devopsconference.com. Uh, lots of really great speakers that are coming along to that. Uh, again, we've got the DevOps Talk Conference is happening face to face down in Melbourne, March 24 to 25, devops.talkboss.com. Uh, we've got KawaiiCon, which is a security focused conference, um, as sort of the spiritual successor to KiwiCon. That's happening on July 1 and 2 uh, in Wellington. So you can find out probably the most accurate info about that is actually their Twitter feed, so KawaiiCon NZ. Uh, and the last one I mentioned is SRECon with uh, Asia Pacific, which uh, Liz is chairing on December 7 to 9, and it's going to be happening in Sydney. So keep an eye out for that as well. I assume there'll be a call for paper soon, which will be lovely to see. Um, I'll include a link to all these events in the meetup event. Uh, so you can, uh, the, in the comment on the meetup event, so you can go find them afterwards as well. Uh, one last thing before I wrap us up tonight, uh, our next meetup is going to be on March 2022. Uh, we're always looking for speakers. So if there's something that you've uh, seen tonight and you're inspired and you want to give a talk, um, feel free to hit me up uh, via through meetup. It's typically the best way to do that. Uh, we would really love to have you speak. It doesn't have to be a full length talk uh, like what we had from Liz tonight. It could be a, a shorter talk, you know, five, 10, 15 minute talk. Um, we'd really love to have, have you speak. If it's the first time that you've spoken as well at an event, we'd also love to have you speak. We try to create as, as safe a welcoming environment as possible for first time speakers. And uh, we'd really love to give you the opportunity to be able to talk at the meetup. All right, well, thank you again. And uh, see you all online in March. Stay safe. Thank you. See you.